Hello everyone, I'm Joel Baird, the General Manager of Missoula Community Access Television. I want to invite you to a program we're going to do on a concept called Jail Diversion. And uh, the formal name of the program in, in Missoula is the Missoula County Jail Diversion Master Plan. In the studio to talk to me about it is Missoula County Sheriff T.J. McDermott and Cynthia Walken, who is a Montana State Senator from District 48. Welcome and thank you for coming over. Thank you, Joel, for having us. Thank you for having us. You're most welcome. So I, I told you I'm going to claim ignorance in this matter, but I did Google uh, a definition uh, for jail diversion, and I came up with this. A general term for those programs that divert, hence the diversion part of the <laughs> the name, divert individuals with serious mental illness and often co-occurring substance abuse disorders away from jail and provide links to community-based treatment and support services. How does that do for a very generalized definition? That's a good definition. Okay. Um, I, I would add to that, Joel, that um, you know our community has been talking about jail diversion uh, for a long time. Uh, when I began my term as sheriff, uh, in January of 2015, uh, overcrowding, uh, over incarceration at the Missoula County Jail uh, had been an issue for several years. Um, there were plans in place to uh, consider adding on or making our current jail larger than, than it is. Um, but one of the things that we know is that a portion of the population um, is in jail uh, due to substance abuse, uh, addiction issues, and, and mental health issues. And so a big part of the definition is um, those folks that have those issues that are also nonviolent and non-dangerous uh, is, is what jail diversion uh, really applies to, and, and that's our focus, is trying to make sure that those people are in the proper system to get the proper care and treatment uh, for those issues and we, we just know that our jail is not that place. Right. And, and Cynthia, your work in Helena at the state level had something to do with the creation of this concept and the implementation of, of steps towards a jail diversion program. Yeah, so at the state level, we're sort of seeing sort of a similar pattern as Missoula County is. Our state crime rate isn't increasing, but our um, you know, the number of people in our secure detention beds is increasing. And so we wanted to sort of gather the data, analyze it, talk to stakeholders and figure out why is this happening? Um, who's in our jail and how can we reduce recidivism? So how can we get people, you know, not sent to jail or prison in the first place? And how can we make sure that, you know, they're less likely to come back? So we're doing that at the state level and um, Sheriff McDermott has really taken the lead in, in um, strategizing at, you know, at the county level for this issue. Gotcha. So the issue, I'm going to rephrase it, right? Just say somebody's <laughs> watching and they're like, what, what do those guys say? Um, you have said that some people, jail is not the best place for them. They have problems, but they're not going to get the services they need to when they're being detained. It, is it a separation to say, this person is not a criminal, they are someone suffering from a mental health disorder or, or defining drug addiction as a uh, health disorder rather than a willful moral issue mm -hmm. that needs punishment? Well, I think we really need to be smart about smart on crime and that's really what this is about and I want to underscore that the population for this study was just people um, people charged with nonviolent offenses so we want to make sure that there's room in our jail and in in our state prison for people who are you know sexual offenders violent offenders a danger to community um, and we wanted to target with this plan people that could you know you know, get the support services they need so that they could get um, help so that they don't come back. You know, if you're a county taxpayer, you're funding the jail. And the jail is a really expensive way to treat a social problem like um, substance abuse, alcoholism, mental health issues. And in fact, it, it doesn't treat it. We're just keeping somebody away from the community for a certain amount of time. But putting someone in jail, ha you know, it doesn't um, in and of itself make that person less likely to commit a crime in the future and that's where treatment programs and the social services and um, really sort of wraparound services that is what 
research has shown actually reduces recidivism. So why aren't we, you know, shifting our resources and our um, the way we we look at the criminal justice system, um, not in a silo anymore, but look at it in terms of how can we sort of, you know, comprehensively address this issue um, in the front end so we can save money on the back end and create the space we need in our jail for the people who really need to be there. And often I think of people that view these types of programs, right, from a, a maybe a harsher level. You know, there are people that have a, like, this is right and wrong, and what you do with wrong is you punish. Often, if you could say to that mindset, well, this saves money, it softens that, that harder moral mm -hmm. point of view. Um, mm -hmm. Even if, if they would not agree that, oh, alcoholism is a disease, right? People debate that, and they say, no, it's a moral issue. But with this type of applying social science to the justice system, it is a way to be more compassionate. And if you don't like that, it's a way of saving money. Right. Does that kind of summarize the debate a little bit? Um, it does. And, uh, you know, one of the important points is, is that our community is growing and our city is growing. So at some point, we may need to build or add on to the jail. But for right now, one thing that's clear is that the alternatives to incarcerations work and the data supports that and if a person who has an addiction issue uh, receives treatment um, some of the accountability programs where they're allowed to be out of jail uh, provide a breast sample in the morning uh, and then provide a breast sample at night in exchange for being out of jail it just allows people to still deal with their charges and their offenses uh, appropriately and be accountable but yet they're allowed to maintain employment and maintain family relationships and, and housing issues and maybe that bump in the road uh, for these folks is a, a little smaller than it would be if all of that was, was taken away from them. So it's, it's truly about um, giving people an opportunity to, to get their life back on track uh, and get the, the care and services that they need uh, from our community to do so. Yeah, because there is that sense too that for some individuals across with the law that may be a mental health thing, an alcoholism or, or substance abuse problem, can spiral into a disaster mm -hmm. for their personal mm -hmm. life. You know, before we started recording, I was telling you about someone I knew that was arrested for a DUI, and while they were incarcerated, one thing after another mm -hmm. went wrong. The, you know, the car was then towed. Then they didn't have money for the, mm -hmm. to get the car out. Uh, they didn't have the car, so they lost their job. They lost their job, so the family was really angry with them, and they disavowed them and said, out into the street you go, and here, you know, from one instance, mm -hmm. this problem just becomes larger and larger because we're supposed to be the people that think of the right thing to do, and if we're not applying social science mm -hmm. of some sort to the situation, things could get a lot worse rather than, than better. Yeah. So that's my personal anecdote. You know, MCAT does deal with a lot of people that are on the lower end of the economic spectrum, some people that are living on the street, and their lives do seem to be a tale of woe, and one cross with the law mm -hmm. could change the direction of their life enormously. And that's really important, I think, Joel, that you said that. A lot of national groups have put, you know, a lot of effort into, you know, having evidence-based, you know, data-driven um, you know, best practices for the criminal justice system. And what you just described, there's, you know, there's data that all of the things that you said are um, leading to leading somebody to be at an increased risk of recidivism. So losing your family support, um, you know, if you're in rural Montana, losing transportation, um, you know, you lose your license, you lose your job, you lose your housing, you know, for people who already are, at, you know, at risk for mental health and um, substance abuse and alcoholism, that is, you know, you're at huge risk of reoffending. So, and again, costing <laughs> costing taxpayers and creating problems that we'd like to solve before they become a bigger problem. And you know, your trip to jail turns into a return trip to the state prison. So yes. Yeah, there's a very yeah. like Charles Dickinsonian, yeah. you know, element running through right. some when you think of the law not evolving over time, you know, like, okay, you're the sheriff, your job is, you know, the judge says they're guilty, you just throw them in jail, that's your job. Very simple, like, ancient way of looking at um, this whole process. Mm -hmm. But did it start at the state level? So I Googled a little something, I said, it said Governor Bullock releases one point something million dollar grant 
to counties to allow them to look at jail diversion programs. Was it a state initiative? That so that grant, yes, it was. Um, legis the the governor's office took a great leadership role in it. Governor Bullock and um, the legislators came together from all kinds of different communities and said we need something because they recognized um, that that our state hospital is just over full and you know counties. We need to have community-based services around Montana. The answer isn't just sending people um, in crisis to either jail or the state hospital. Um, so those jail diversion grants are to various communities to develop programs um, within their own communities to keep people there. Uh, one part of the grant is for secure detention beds. So if somebody is um, having an acute mental health crisis, um, they're low income, it, you know, maybe they need to be secured for like a night or two, these facilities create that place because uh, in Missoula we don't have anything like that. And emergency departments at our hospitals are just not equipped to handle this um, issue. So it's going to take uh, a lot of effort at this county level, the state level, the city level, um, and sometimes at the federal level to, to get the funding we need for some of these services that Yes, they cost money up front, um, but there is a significant cost savings. So that's what sort of this plan is, a roadmap of where we should be concentrating our efforts and our resources. TJ, just to underline that, though what if you don't know, um, the cost of incarcerating an individual at the county jail on Mullen Road for a day? So that cost is roughly about $108 a day. And uh, we know that um, some of the sobriety programs, the uh, ankle bracelets, the GPS monitoring uh, can be around 10 to $20 a day. Right. So that's a substantial uh, difference um, in cost and, and savings to the mm -hmm. taxpayer. And, and we know that when people are on those programs, um, more so than not, they comply and, and they're very successful uh, staying out of jail. That, that's a real benefit to people to be able to stay out of jail. And it's a condition, isn't it often, that if someone's undergoing a substance abuse treatment program, they have to attend regularly, complete mm -hmm. the program to avoid a jail sentence. That's true. Uh, they are held accountable and there are provisions and conditions uh, that they have to follow in order to be out um, in the first place. Right. And, and you were touching on a, a, a problem sort of unique to the western states, vast areas mm -hmm. of land and social services, you know, we have these population clusters, mm -hmm. but as far as I know, Warm Springs is the only comprehensive psychiatric hospital in the entire state. Mm -hmm. So that not being able to provide critical mental health services in each of our cities it's a huge obstacle. By the time the person may be diagnosed and transported, they've already undergone yeah. some extraordinary trauma mm -hmm. of some sort by the time yeah. they even end up there while having a psychotic episode to boot. Yeah, we heard from a lot of people in the community that serve this population that, you know, they're just crying out for these services and it, it shouldn't be that the only way people can get services is to be arrested. I mean, that's how a lot of people find themselves at Warm Springs is, you know, if the county sheriff is responsible for transporting them and, you know, it shouldn't be that way. We should be able to provide people services without criminalizing, you know, their crisis. Right. Yeah, th that does seem like a, a really compassionate stance to families dealing with mental illness and, of course, the person experiencing it themselves. How will it play out in Missoula City County, will there be a coordinated effort to try to involve existing social services? Well, one of the great things about this plan is is that our community is ripe for this. I mean, we know that we are lacking services. Uh, we desperately need a 24-hour mental health crisis facility. We desperately need an expansion of pretrial uh, facilities and some housing options uh, for people when they get out of out of jail but I have to say I'm so impressed Joel with the group that I work with um, Senator Wolken, uh, County Commissioner Colaroli and then City Councilwoman Emily Bentley really some young passionate uh, leaders in our community that um, are taking this to the next step and to touch base more on your question is part of that step um, was working with the stakeholders and working with people in the criminal justice profession, in the medical and mental health professional, and uh, 
the, the social services and people that are dealing with homelessness and, and uh, housing crisis issues and employment. So this truly is a, is a great organization of all of these uh, groups coming together uh, and the data along with it to support this plan. So I, I think for the first time, Missoula and Missoula County will probably be um, cutting edge in the state to uh, bring a proposal forward that will adopt some of these uh, recommendations uh, that the plan has made. And I think we're gonna lead the state in that effort. Uh, other jurisdictions have tried uh, jail bonds um, to build new jails or larger jails, yeah. and, and they've failed miserably. And so uh, I think the time is right and our community is right to really uh, take a look at the services we need and include all of our partners. Uh, both of our hospitals have been uh, actively involved in uh, discussions um, due to uh, what happens in their emergency room and some of the un uncompensated care that they provide. Yeah. And uh, so we're, we're really in a position now where I think we're going to be able to, to bring this plan forward, have some things adopted that'll benefit a, a great deal of people in our community and, and their families. And the plan is pretty detailed. I saw it on the screen. I don't know, Scott, have you put the plan up or, or could you? Uh, and the, the link to the plan, I always tell people to Google, right? So <laughs> yeah. just Google Missoula Jail Diversion Master Plan, but they will find it on the county website. Yes. And is it on the city website? Yes, we tried that, and I think it is. we got somewhere. And, and so if people are interested in learning more about it, they can read the plan. Do you need help? Do you need volunteers? Do you need someone in the community to step up and say, I can help in this way? I think so right now it's a draft plan, and we would really love um, feedback. And, and please don't be intimidated by the length of the plan. A lot of it is, you know, charts and, and, and graphs on some of the population so um, and if you if you want to skip to just the in at the very end there's um, three or four pages of just the recommendation so you can just look at what the recommendations are um, but really this is a community document and um, it'll be hopefully adopted in some form by the city and county so um, so far all of the feedback we've had is been really positive and people really connect with it because I think everybody has either themselves or a loved one or somebody they know some sort of interaction with the jail or law enforcement that you know had there been some um, better services or something out there it might have had a better outcome or they had a really positive experience and they want to reflect that too so just getting people's feedback I think is really helpful because we want to incorporate that as as best we can um, when we present the final plan so there, there's like a, a call for public input. Yes. So people yes. said, oh, I had this experience. Everything helps, right, mm -hmm. to get the larger population to understand the issues that are involved. Personal anecdotes, for instance, could help. Sure, yeah. And you had an email address, and Scott's going to put that up. And that, that could be used to provide input to the plan yes. or any reaction they have. I mean, they've just maybe they've watched the few minutes we've talked about it, and people yeah. could email do you Absolutely. remember the address? It uh, is jail diversion, one word, yeah. at missoulacounty.us. Oh, uh, that's not that so hard. Okay. No, no. It's <laughs> so jail diversion at missoulacounty.us. Yeah. Okay. And for the other work, of course, you're on the inside track with the social services, with the, the various health providers. Mm -hmm. So that part, you guys got covered. It's not like you have to go find them. Right. <laughs> you know where they are. Yeah. Right. Well, is there anything you want to add? Well, one of the things that we've uh, done uh, prior to the master plan uh, coming out and being adopted um, at our detention center is we created uh, an administrative lieutenant position. And her duties specifically uh, daily are to monitor the jail population, identify people that are nonviolent, non-dangerous, uh, people with substance abuse or addiction issues or mental health issues, and then to work with um, the prosecutors and the judges to uh, divert those mm -hmm. people and, and work on getting them in the, in the proper place for uh, care and treatment. So we've already initiated that. Uh, we do have a mental health provider uh, in our facility that uh, we've moved into our booking area uh, so that she can be there when folks are brought right. in um, and she'll be there and available. Um, also our deputies uh, and our detention officers um, have undergone uh, crisis intervention training, um, which is really uh, a 
community policing philosophy where law enforcement uh, brings together mental health uh, professionals, uh, family members um, out in the field and uh, tries to divert uh, individuals uh, with mental illnesses or substance abuse issues prior to them being arrested. Mm -hmm. And so the decision can be made out on the street with the, the patrol officer or deputy along with a mental health provider to uh, get that person at that point diverted before they go into the court system, before they have charges and uh, conditions. So we've, we've uh, trained uh, quite a few of our detention officers as well as our deputies. Um, we held training here in April um, and hopefully that training mm -hmm. will uh, continue because it's, it's proven to be very uh, valuable. Uh, to be able to deal with things uh, right off the bat at the yeah. beginning uh, in the field Diffuse before they situations mm -hmm. before they become more violent and in, and or or involve more charges for the individual. Exactly. So it's uh, those are all things that we've been able to do uh, within our existing uh, personnel or staffing line to add the position, but then also our training uh, budget that we've found a way to just make it happen because we know that it's a priority and then at some point it's going to dovetail real nicely with this uh, jail diversion master plan. I gotcha. And I think, it, it, yeah, it's important to note as um, Sheriff McDermott said, he's implementing a lot of the recommendations that were really related to the jail or the sheriff's office. Um, already there's been increased programming at the jail because that's something that's been really shown to, to help people while you have them there. Um, so he started, um, there's a parenting class there now for parents and um, just sort of improving the programming so we sort of meet people where they are and um, make sure that they, the time that they spend there, at least they're getting you know, some benefit from that. Right, so that it has a corrective atmosphere rather than a punitive atmosphere. I mean, it seems to me a very old debate you know, in people's minds, trying to, to distinguish the criminal from the pathetic in a way, you know, like what is deserving of condemnation? What is deserving of compassion? How do you define, you know, a moral act? Is this individual capable of discerning between right and wrong? All of these factors come into play. And I'm, I'm happy to see it. Almost like science is being applied yes. to this very important human interaction. Who's in society? Who's out of society? When you're in trouble, who's going to understand more of what's going on? Yeah. And the bottom line, too, is savings, right? Mm -hmm. yes, that, yes. That overall the program promises to save taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. It is. It's, it's a less expensive uh, alternative than, than adding on to our existing jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, it's good. It's a, it's a good thing for our community. Um, the leadership that we have uh, on the jail diversion board, uh, both with local and, and uh, in Senator Wilkins case, uh, state representatives, um, I, I believe we're going to accomplish some great things uh, with this master plan for our community. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Joel. Oh, you know it. And thanks for watching this program. As always, if you know of a group or issue you'd like to see on MCAT, give us a call. The number is 542-6228. For MCAT, I'm Joel Baird. Thanks for watching.